Well, welcome to this professional society. Welcome online followers also. Uh, well, it's a real pleasure to have uh, Professor Martis Paparistis, a well-known, uh, very young tourist, I must say, and who uh, is participating in a regional program uh, organized by the United Nations and uh, found his time to come to the, to the university. And we decided to organize this at this international study to have uh, the possibility to share views with the persons who uh, in the different uh, centers, uh, the academia, students, uh, practitioners, and so on. He will be, he's also a member of the International Law Commission, that is something that was a bit of invitation. But I must say that, that he has been very generous uh, with uh, his teaching, and he would like to uh, reflect together with you on uh, how to strengthen the functions of international law through the work of the International Law Commission, which is a comprehensive title, but at the same time, it will go in depth into certain topics that the Commission is uh, addressing. So thank you very much for accepting this invitation. It's a real honor to have you here. You have to. Um, yes. Well, thank you very much. Are you comfortable here? I'm feeling it. It's um, very, 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 very comfortable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for the very, very kind of introduction of the Atlantic Coffee. It's a great, great pleasure to be here and um, delighted to see such a forum and online audience. Um, my presentation falls essentially in two parts. And I think the overall theme is that I would want to uh, suggest at some point that are perhaps more obvious, some things that might be reflective of my own experience on the International Law Commission for the last uh, two years, and also just to bring us all up to speed to what the Commission is doing now and what it has done recently. I think the sense is that that will give us enough uh, time and material for a lively and robust discussion because, of course, on many of these points, there is a degree of uh, reasonable disagreement. Uh, essentially, I want to first say a few things about the International Law Commission as such to bring us all to the same speed and then go more deeply on particular issues on the current agenda. Starting with a picture, uh, that is the uh, new composition of the International Law Commission uh, for the 2023-2027 uh, quinquennium. The picture was taken last year and a very uh, careful watchers will know that it is already inaccurate uh, because uh, uh, our member, Mr. Bogdan Arishchu, has been elected uh, to the International Court of Justice. So the gentleman, almost at the middle of the third row, is now the International Court. And as his replacement, we elected uh, for the casual vacancy, Ms. Selina Orosan, uh, the legal advisor of the Romanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But also share a secret that 
this is probably a skillful working of Photoshop because it was <laughs> impossible to arrange all the ILC members to be in the room at the same time. So there are at least three <laughs> have been Photoshopped in. <laughs> Actually, interesting game of trying to figure out who is a Photoshop in and who is genuinely in the room. So, what is the International uh, Law Commission? Uh, as a general technical institutional law proposition, it is a subsidiary organ of the UN General Assembly. And I imagine that as international lawyers, we have all made that phrase in the introduction of many a plot, but actually it is important. International Law Commission does not float in outer space. International Law Commission is an institution within the setting of the United Nations, of the United Nations General Assembly. And so its qualities, assessments and failures have to be judged against the background of the United Nations of the time and of the broader international law of the time. Uh, that I have to say is perhaps the bigger takeaway that I have had out of these two years, perhaps the clear appreciation of how deeply International Law Commission is entrenched with the General Assembly, how important it is that uh, ILC members are elected by the General Assembly, how important it is that they are elected within strictly delineated regional groups. That is a very important element of the universalism of the uh, International Law Commission. In that sense, it is different from the International Court of Justice, where, as we know, there are traditionally allocated seats, but ultimately, legally speaking, it is electoral vote that uh, drives and delineates these results. So that is not the case in the International Law Commission. Regional representation is a necessary aspect there. There are many things that the International Law Commission does, and that is, again, perhaps one of those points that I was aware in a more abstract sense, but perhaps projecting my own intellectual perspectives, it's probably mostly thinking of what the International Law Commission does with an eye to the great codification projects, law of treaties, uh, Geneva Convention on Law of the Sea, uh, diplomatic consular relations, of course, state responsibility. So, in a sense, articles as the normal form of the output in the traditional times during the Cold War forming the basis uh, for international conferences that adopt these documents. More recently, uh, as the 2001 articles on state responsibility were internationally on blacks, being taken note of and commended uh, by the General Assembly. But there are many other forms of output uh, that are being used by the International Law Commission. So more recently, quite a few things have been expressed in the form of conclusions. Conclusions on identification of customer international law. Conclusions on interpretation uh, of treaties by reference to subsequent practice and agreement. Draft conclusions on use corgans. Principles. Um, uh, principles on environmental protection and armed uh, conflict, for example, guidelines, uh, reports, and of course, still draft articles, draft articles on crimes against humanity, draft articles of uh, uh, protection of persons in the events of disasters. So there's a great deal of subtlety in the form of outputs that is elaborated and reflected upon with an eye to the topic. I think sometimes also aesthetic preferences of rapporteurs. What do they think fits best their own approach and their own style? And so if you look at it from the perspective of states, one element of feedback that uh, states make in the Sixth Committee is that states would sometimes find more helpful to have greater clarity so what is the difference between articles, conclusions, principles, guidelines, reports? Is that an aesthetic choice? Sort of, you know, we are familiar with the idea that 
treaties may be called many things, but in a legal sense, a covenant, a charter, an agreement, and a treaty will be a treaty. It's perfectly fine to have an aesthetic judgment in international law. Or is that something that necessarily connotates certain juridical implications? That is an ongoing discussion to which international law commission has not given an entirely clear answer. And there are also a variety of figures in the architecture of the International Law Commission. The Chair Commission, who drives the discussion, special operators who come with their reports that start the discussion. There are also important study groups and working groups, and we'll come to the sea level rise as a particularly influential one. And also a figure of the chairperson of the drafting committee, who chairs the drafting discussion within which the provisions are elaborated. So I think you know the sense of the procedural and practical realities and dynamic shape very much what International Law Commission can do and what can be expected of it. So some, I think, points are already made here, but perhaps just to drive home the importance, and I hope that perhaps I think that a slide might be big enough that the excerpt from 1998 um, uh, annual report, which sets out the criteria for selection of topics. Uh, and it says that the topic should reflect the needs of states, it should be sufficiently advanced in stage in terms of state practice to permit development of qualification, and it should be concrete and feasible enough for progressive development and qualification. And then the fourth, so a bit of a coda, the idea of openness to new topics. And that I think is also an important point that it's the topics are not picked up for sheer intellectual pursuit, although of course they are incredibly intellectually exciting. It is something that fits within the institutional fabric of the general assembly. Needs of states, sufficiency of state practice, ability to come up with a product. So it reflects a certain conception of the mandate and the function of the International Law Commission, serve as, as somehow described as the think tank of the general assembly. There are, of course, broader constituencies, but the formation of the commission and operation of the commission is geared uh, towards states there. And that, I mean, it sort of makes sense, I suppose, tracing backwards, what sort of things should commission be doing are the sort of things that an institution functioning and creating a certain manner would do. So lawyers are the people who sit in the commission. So the topics should be lawyerly, legal, or predominantly legal. Those are topics that benefit from engagement with perspectives of states. Now, to be clear, it doesn't mean that the only things important in international law are things that are of interest to states and that are formally legal. But in this particular setting, it does make sense to focus on them. There are many other places in the international legal order where there are different people do different things. Here, the particular added value is for such topics, for topics that to some extent can afford to wait. That again, there are other places in international law where things can be done very speedily if the politics and the legal argument requires so. And international law commission strength is precisely the iterative process slow production of provisions, commentaries, feedback by states every autumn in the Sixth Committee in the International Law Week, and then taking that feedback and suggestions into account next year. Uh, and also, I think the point that not duplicating things that are being done elsewhere, the sort of very loose sense of subsidiarity playing to one's strengths, not replicating things that specialized organizations are already doing or doing better. And it's of course very hard to say what is the thing of the added value because the background politics can change. I think a very good example for that, that sometimes one doesn't really know whether a project fits a need or not, are uh, the is the commission's work on protection of atmosphere 
something that the International Tribunal of Law of the Sea uh, uh, referred to approvingly uh, in its opinion on climate change. <laughs> but before that, if you read the uh, materials in the Sixth Committee and the commentaries, it had a somewhat uneasy fit. And there were many things that the International Law Commission sort of self-delineated itself and said that we are not going to be dealing with that. But International Tribunal for Law of the Sea found particular propositions very helpful. So this is not strict science. Perhaps to some extent there is an element of art, an element of judgment of what fits the political and legal needs now and what might fit the international community in the future. And perhaps the last general point that I would want to make is the idea of taking multilingualism seriously. Uh, the three working languages uh, in English, French, and Spanish, to the extent possible, working in parallel in it with these three documents. I was the chairperson of the drafting committee last year, and I have to say that it was very, uh, it was intellectually fascinating. It was certainly post challenges for controlling discussion if three language discussions of a particular provision were focusing on three very distinct issues that were found to exist in different languages. But that certainly strengthens uh, the work of the Commission uh, and it enables drawing upon different styles of reasoning and different materials in a way that purely Anglophone and equally purely Francophone or purely a Spanish speaking perspective would not. I would sort of again taking that seriously. And that of course requires a particular approach to work, uh, a very practical sense, leaving time for translations and taking into account multilinguistic perspective. That I think strikes, uh, strikes me as a very, very, very powerful expression. I think that's a professional deformation that I now find very hard to was have a discussion on universal issues in a single language. It just seems that naturally there should be a third of the group who would be speaking in French and in Spanish, and that one would be switching off the microphones and uh, doing translation matters. So uh, these things, I think, are probably uh, known to the uh, such a sophisticated audience, and perhaps as a way of background, what has been done there's a great deal of things that have been done on sources. Uh, treaties, in particular, is a point on which the Commission has been very strong. And in the current agenda, there are three topics, general principles, subsidiary means, and non-legally binding arrangements. Uh, international responsibility and dispute settlement is something where, on responsibility, the Commission has been very influential. On dispute settlement, somewhat less so, uh, with just the modal rules and article procedure there in the background. But I think as those of you who have followed specialized fields will know, for example, they were very influential in the drafting of the visa convention, providing certain assumptions. And so currently, uh, the Commission is looking at two topics on succession of states and state responsibility, and that settlement of disputes. Uh, law of international spaces, so in the broader sense, is one uh, more uh, area of strength. Um, law of the sea, transboundary water law, guidelines on the protection of atmosphere that I mentioned, and sea level rise as a current topic uh, for which there is a great deal of interest for states. So, um, the highlighted ones I will now in the second part of my presentation move in greater detail, but we'll simply say something briefly on the three that I am not highlighting here because they were not dealt in detail and substance this year so far. One is a topic uh, that I'm sure is known to you both on the merits and because of the new special rapporteur, is immunity of state officials from foreign criminal jurisdiction, for which Professor Claudio Grossman was elected last year as the special rapporteur. 
the third special rapporteur uh, taking over uh, from uh, Professor Escobar Fernandez, uh, the second special rapporteur, uh, who concluded the first reading uh, before the end of the previous plenum. So this is something where we will start uh, the work on the second reading, uh, just as we reconvene for the second half of the session on 1st of July. Um, and the first report by the special operator has been submitted and when it has been translated in all the uh, United Nations working languages, it will be put online likely within the next uh, next few weeks. So I will not say anything more about it, except perhaps to know that this is one of the topics uh, that states are interested in. Uh, there are great questions of legal principle, and there are also grand political controversies. Um, and the question I think will be about the legal contribution that the uh, commission can bring uh, to the matter. The second topic, succession of states in respect of state responsibility, is currently dealt with by a working group uh, chaired by August Reinisch, and it was a topic that was previously uh, dealt with by Pavel Sturma as a special rapporteur, but because he's not uh, a member of the International Law Commission in the current quinquennium, there's a bit of a reflection by the International Law Commission of how to approach the next. And then the third topic is uh, general principles of law. Um, again, a Latin American uh, chaired uh, topic. Uh, Marcelo Vasquez Bermudez is uh, the special rapporteur. It was adopted on the first reading last year. Uh, states have until the end of this year to provide comments on the first reading materials. And next year, it will be addressed in the second reading. So many classic questions of sources of public international law, uh, particularly the very intriguing category, the second category of general principles of law, general principles formed within the international legal system, uh, in addition to perhaps the more traditionally accepted category of um, general principles derived from commonalities in a domestic legal system. So interesting and fun things, but uh, to be dealt at a different point. Let me say now a bit more about the topics that are being dealt with on substance. Uh, the first and probably one that uh, for which there is the greatest interest uh, by states is the topic of sea level rise in relation to international law. It is dealt with not by the special rapporteur, but by study. And I think sort of it reflects the judgment of the International Law Commission in the previous quinquennium that this is something where a broad discussion of the issues and directions would be helpful in the beginning. And the format of the study group has been employed several times historically, probably the ones that come to mind more recently is a study group chaired by Marty Costiniemi on fragmentation and the study group chaired by uh, now Judge uh, Georg Nolte on treaties and time, which then led uh, to uh, Judge Nolte's uh, appointment as a special rapporteur on treaty interpretation. So this uh, study group was established in 2019 with five chairs, uh, and uh, Mr. Sise, Mr. Jacoba Sise was then appointed as a special rapporteur on piracy. So four uh, co-chairs have uh, you know, driven the work. Uh, Mr. Bogdan Aureschu, now on the International Court of Justice, uh, and Madame Oral uh, took the leadership on the first aspect, so effect of sea level rise all over the sea. And Madame Galo Telesh and Mr. Juan José Santolaria uh, took the 
second <laughs> uh, two topics, uh, Van Galvan Telesh uh, with a focus on protection of persons and Mr. Santolaria uh, the focus on statehood. And so it was sort of done in two circles. They first produced two issues papers, and then in this quinquennium, additional papers to the first and the second issues papers. Uh, so what is the question? Uh, for the law of the sea, one might say that the, at its core, the very important issue can be conceptualized as relating to a particular question of law of the sea and identification of maritime spaces and boundaries with the question whether baselines, so essentially the lines uh, across the land territory uh, from which the maritime entitlements are projected into the maritime space are used as ambulatory, essentially with the movement of the sea, they move forwards and backwards, or in some sense fixed, that they would not be affected by sea level rise in relation to climate change. And I think on this point, International Law Commission on its own served in the previous quinquennium the very helpful role as enticing and perhaps to some extent one might even say provoking state practice, providing states an opportunity to formulate and express their views on the matter. And as uh, International Law Commission and co-chairs have summarized, there has been a degree of a shift in the direction and through somewhat different legal routes, many states have taken a view that it would make good sense. Uh, I think that there is a lot of careful reading of what reflects a view on the legal position and what reflects a view on the good policy destination for which different legal rules might be provided to uh, protect the position of the affected states. So you know, a great deal of policy and political sympathy for small island developing states, least as it were, guilty uh, for uh, a climate a change in this regard, most uh, directly affected to some extent, solidify uh, their entitlements. At the same time, a very strong emphasis throughout on the cardinal and primordial role of UNCLOS and the balance of UNCLOS that should not be disrupted. And so this is something that um, inter that International Law Commission last year, next year, will be finalizing its work and proposing uh, the way forward. I think that, that is probably sort of the lawyerly way of thinking through how to articulate the important concerns without disrupting the overall balance of clause on which there is very strong support by states. Um, on state and human rights, uh, this is something that the <coughs> National Law Commission Study Group has discussed this year, and you will see uh, the uh, summary in this year's report. But essentially, if for law of the sea, one could say that the question is a very important, but in a sense, rather technical question of characterization of baselines. Uh, on statehood and human rights, the types of questions are different. On statehood, is really a rather broadly posed question of whether the sea level rise and its effect on the land territory uh, in a factual sense and inhabitability of that territory due to advancement of salt water affects the usual conceptions of statehood where state practice is really at the very early stages of development. There are some very interesting developments and some of you might have read uh, the news last year about the draft treaty between Tuvalu and Australia. So very interesting developments. And the second theme is human rights, where 
again, unlike the other two points, a great deal is happening in a great deal of specialized settings at the universal level, at the regional level. Um, and one has, I suppose, to think through it of being sufficiently concrete as to be helpful, but also not undermining developments that are taking place elsewhere. So the European Court of Human Rights, uh, a couple of months ago, rendered a judgment against Switzerland regarding climate change. Last month, um, the International Tribunal of Law of the Sea, in its advisory opinion, did not address human rights directly, but in a passage noted the broader context uh, of the existential threats and uh, uh, human dignity at play. Several judges, including Judge Infante Coffey, noted uh, in their separate uh, writings that uh, broader context. And I think that, that is something that states certainly are reflecting very, very carefully upon. And of course, into the American Court of Human Rights uh, had its all pleadings, and the opinion will be coming out. Um, states are have been given a bit of a deadline extension. Just, I think that students would appreciate deadline extension. States <laughs> also appreciate deadline extension to protest on the second round of written statements. So it's sort of these are things that are discussed in many settings. I think it's, I mean, International Commission is certainly very conscious that this is not the only place in the international architecture where these points are dealt with. So that is one thing. Now for something completely different. And I think, again, that is one of the things that I perhaps have not fully appreciated about the International Law Commission, how wonderfully messy and not connected all the topics are, mm -hmm. representing in a way the very decentralized character of international law and things that states and other actors have to deal with. It's not, it doesn't have the nice neatness that perhaps the PhD thesis might have just diving through on something. That one has to switch the mind from doing sea level rise in the morning and settlement of disputes with international organizations in the afternoon and piracy and immunity on the next day. So, so there has to be a certain degree of intellectual omnivariousness. You have to be interested in everything. What about, so this topic is, some, is one of three topics that were started last year, uh, starting with this point when we can, with special rapporteur August Reinisch. Last year, uh, several changes were made. One was to change the title. Uh, the title that was originally proposed was Settlement of International Disputes. That was the syllabus that was proposed by Sir Michael Wood in 2016. Uh, and there the focus was international disputes in the sense of non-disputes uh, arising under law other than international. Uh, and last year, after a great deal of discussion and taking into account comments of states, a view was taken that actually the most exciting and probably the most problematic or promising, probably depending on the perspective developments, are raised precisely in cases that do not necessarily raise international issues. So private law claims are uh, brought uh, by actors other than states and the tension that that might put sometimes on communities of international organizations or domestic courts. So that I think is sort of, I guess, the, the real life question that uh, states uh, and other actors are thinking about. So the one scenario that came up uh, several times in the plenary discussion is the IP cholera case. Questions about sort of a certain sense of, you know, whether there might be cases where <laughs> affected actors do not have a clear forum to go to, where broad immunities that generally pursue very, very important purposes of ensuring functions of organizations act 
so as to effectively block everything and that there's no path towards which to go. And so the sense of access to justice on access to forum as an important consideration, particularly for uh, claims brought by actors other than states or organizations, you know, was something that was coming up quite a lot in comments by states. Uh, last year, um, two uh, guidelines were adopted. Sorry, I have it three on the slide, but two were adopted. Uh, apart from the point that I made about the scope of the um, project, the one point that last year gave rise to a great deal of discussion was the definition of international organizations. And that is something that the International Law Commission has dealt with several times. In 1986, uh, uh, sort of in the work that eventually became the Vienna Convention on Law Treaties, also regarding international organizations, organizations were defined as intergovernmental organizations. And that, as you will appreciate when you reflect upon it, is not even descriptively accurate as a matter of contemporary practice. There are many organizations that have other international organizations as parties. So European Union, by way of example, is a party to many uh, such uh, instruments. It uh, could be that um, there are actors that are neither states nor international organizations. We can think, you know, customs territories within the World Trade Organization, or indeed actors that are, that are perhaps the broader, looser sense of uh, you know, the broader civil society and community. So in 2011, uh, within the work on articles on responsibility of international organizations, International Law Commission provided a broader definition for which the emphasis in the definition was on the possession of its own international legal personality. Um, this approach is, um, it has certain intuitive attraction, plainly personality has something to do with subject or here, but it was also criticized and it was criticized in particular by uh, people coming from the international institutions, international organizations, well, and for them, uh, personality, is, so there's a degree of sloppiness in drafting. They felt that personality is a consequence of an organization being a subject rather than being an element of a definition. So expressing it in these terms sort of conflates layers of analysis. There was also a concern that um, it doesn't really provide a helpful analytical tool. Um, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. Oh, yes, uh, there, there's, a, there's a seat in front. Yes. Uh, very... Sorry, sorry, because I was uh, thinking about um, yeah. <laughs> One point was that in a sense, kind of if you imagine that if you are sitting in a domestic court or in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and you are asked to determine whether some peculiar animal is an organization or it is not, if you are told, you know, the decisive criterion is whether they have a personality, it's probably not going to be very helpful. Now, it may be that the particular institution's foundational instrument says one way or the other, but most don't. I mean, when they do, it's usually by reference to personality in domestic law. Uh, so there needs to be something that is more amenable to a way of asking questions. And within international institutional law, so if we look at you know, the blockers and Shermer's book on international institutions, the second underlined point about organ capable of expressing a will distinct from that of its members is a way how it is usually captured. Uh, and that is, you can immediately appreciate, there is a way of asking practical questions. You can imagine, you know, sort of asking, you know, what is your mandate? How do you exercise it? Have you have particular examples? And so on. 
And so that was essentially the special rapporteur's proposal to replace personality with a focus on one organ. And as a result of a broader discussion, a compromise proposal was adopted where his personality was retained, but also an emphasis was placed explicitly on an organ a distinct, um, with a will distinct from that of its members. And there's a very interesting discussion by states in the system. Some states found it helpful precisely for these practical reasons. Others felt that the 2011 definition actually worked reasonably well, and they didn't feel that there were broader issues there. Um, this year, uh, the Commission continued the discussion and looked more deeply on disputes between organizations and organization and disputes between organizations and states. And the special operator had prepared a very detailed example of practice of international organizations in that regard. Uh, I think what I would like to highlight here, and you know, this is uh, summarized in the chairperson's report um, that was um, uh, released in the end of May, a big discussion was about the right, the most, I suppose, the most efficient way of categorizing disputes. And there was a sense that they were somewhat, they were different kinds of disputes, that disputes between an international organization and a state is a different sort of dispute from high tea color dispute where victims are trying to bring a claim against the international organization. But there was this agreement of how to draw the line. Uh, some people felt that the better way to draw the line, the more sort of traditional way to draw the line would be by reference to applicable law. That there are disputes on the basis of public international law and disputes on the basis of other fields of law, mostly a domestic law. And so if I bracket here the question of the internal rules of the organization, um, something that um, the International Law Commission sort of dealt with in passing in the 2011 articles, but um, uh, there is, I think, a degree of disagreement of what sort of animal, legally speaking, these internal rules are. But so one way would be to say there are public international law disputes and the character of subject is irrelevant. What matters is that it's international law dispute or a non-international law dispute. A slightly different way would be to say that the categories are disputes between organizations and organizations, organizations and states, and disputes between organizations and actors other than organizations and states mostly non-state entities. And there would be a significant degree of overlap, but not a complete one. So there are some, for example, investment arbitrations against the European Union that are directly on the basis of public international law. Uh, European Union may join European Convention of Human Rights, and then it could be responsible in that setting as well. And there are also arbitrations between organizations and individuals on the basis of public international law. So the Bank of International Settlements is one prominent example there. And as you can see from the, from the plenary discussion, I inclined <coughs> in that direction. It seemed to me that that was a more traditional lawyerly way of drawing distinction, one with which um, you know, international law was quite familiar with, to the extent that we think about responsibility within the field of responsibility, that is how we look at, at the applicable law. But ultimately, a consensus decision was taken that the major way would be to look at subjects. Uh, because subjects, perhaps in a very simplistic sense, that there's a particular kind of asymmetry in disputes between organizations and non-state actors that would be to a lesser extent present in disputes between organizations, organizations, and organizations, and states, which are, of course, extremely different, but in an important sense also recognizably different from disputes with non state actors. And so that was the approach that is reflected here. We have these, which one might, with a great deal of caution, view as more horizontal type disputes. And so we have a language which draws 
as you will see to some extent on the Article 33 of UN Charter, Manila Declaration framework of the importance of good faith and spirit of cooperation, attention to the appropriateness of circumstance and nature of the dispute. Things shouldn't go to courts. Uh, that shouldn't be the preference. Uh, there's a very helpful memorandum that was prepared, to which organizations gave responses. And actually, organizations seem quite comfortable with mostly negotiating uh, these solutions. Uh, there is a preference, you know, a qualified one in draft guideline five as appropriate to perhaps can give more accessibility to formalize this supplement, but without prioritizing it, without saying that it's better or that it should be more used. It should be more widely accessible. Uh, let me just uh, think I'll probably have about sort of five or seven oh, minutes. Fine. Oh, count. <laughs> still, I think that the audience is still, I think, attentive as far as I see. Yeah. All right. Uh, and so next year, the thing I think probably that would be quite exciting next year, the third report would be that this would be the very practically, conceptually interesting questions of uh, organization, private actor disputes, and uh, again, I, as I expressed in my plenary statement, hopefully something more also on disputes involving internal rules of organization, because that is something where a great deal of interest comes in practice. The next topic, also something that was started last year, is subsidiary means for the termination of rules of international law, the slightly cumbersome phrase uh, that we know from um, 38.1d uh, of the ICJ statute that the French captures much more elegantly as la doctrine. So much more, much more to the point. Um, last year, one thing that I thought was rather important one was a point made in draft conclusion to uh, subparagraph C. So the acceptance that there may be other means in addition to decisions of courts and tribunals and teachings. You know, it's not a free for all. You know, it's a rather balanced expression generally used. So sort of building back, I guess, in a sense that there may be other things that are generally used in practice. And I think probably by implication accepted by the relevant authorities as being a subsidiary means and therefore falling within the function of subsidiary means. There are you know, reasonable disagreement of how to articulate it. In my own plenary statement, I said that I would have been more comfortable of using essentially the same technique of you looking at how these things are done in practice to understand what decisions of courts and tribunals and teachings mean. That perhaps thinking of it as an evolutive concept or as a composite phrase might be more elegant and a more, perhaps a more appropriately modest way of looking at it, that we shouldn't think that in 2020s, we know everything about all the means that are there. The 38.1D might look archaic, but I think in a way it's its great strength. It doesn't say much, but it is flexible enough to accommodate all the extraordinary expansion of international institutions for the last century. But these are workings by consensus and ultimately International Law Commission concluded that it was important to explicitly highlight these matters. It is not something that has been dealt with yet, but it's as a footnote, as a signal that this is something that one would be dealing in the future. Draft conclusion three identifies the sort of things that one should be looking at in assessing the weight of subsidiary means. And this strikes me as potentially very important in practice, not necessarily for what might say traditional courts and tribunals. I don't think that international tribunal for law, the C, needs to be told what sort of criteria one needs to look at to weigh them. But there will be specialized tribunals, there will be domestic courts for which international law is not their daily bread and butter. 
And it's important that these institutions are told what sort of things you ask. You ask what sort of institution it is, how well they reason, uh, how representative it all is, how states and other entities receive it. I think that these are things that we probably would have all roughly thought intuitively we would look at in determining whether a particular piece of writing or a particular judgment is a good one or a bad one. But I do think it's helpful that it's spelled out. Uh, it's always, you know, even very obvious things, if they are spelled out, it goes some way. Uh, conclusions four and five go a bit further on courts and tribunals and teachings. But I can't say that draft conclusion four broadly summarizes what ILC already said in the work on customary international law. Draft conclusion five goes a bit further. Uh, it emphasizes the importance of the breadth of representation, the various legal systems and regions of the world. And I think, and that was overall very positively received by states in the Sixth Committee, the last phrase of having regard to two kinds of diversity, linguistic diversity and gender diversity, which I think go to two slightly different elements of perhaps kind of ways for capturing universality at its best, as in the world of international law commission, and also emphasizing the focus on those aspects of representation that may have been historically, for a variety of reasons, disregarded. And so that was viewed by the commission as making an important point that was important to make, and states, I think, overall agree there was a those states that spoke about it mostly emphasize uh, their agreement. Uh, three draw conclusions were adopted this year, um, uh, and they fall into two categories. Draw conclusion six uh, speaks about nature and function of subsidiary means. And it says that they are not a source of law, but their, their function is to assist uh, with the termination of existence of content. Now, you might say to some extent it makes the an obvious commonsensical point, but sometimes commonsensical points are worth uh, being said as well. And at least in my plenary statement, I suggested that perhaps it might make sense to eventually move this draft conclusion somewhere to the very front so that the reader gets the point immediately. Paragraph two makes, uh, goes to a somewhat narrower point that, as you know, there are different things that different tools can do. So a domestic court judgment, for example, can explain what international law is. And in that sense, it is a subsidiary. Means. But it is also a piece of state practice and opinion or juris. And so paragraph two is a simply without prejudice clause that we are familiar with it, that Particular materials can be doing two things simultaneously. And the fact that it's subsidiary means doesn't mean that it is not something else. Draw conclusions seven and eight uh, go to the judicial point. And there, what we are saying is that they may be followed as a descriptive matter, but they are not legally binding unless otherwise provided for. And so that reflects the general default position in public international law that judgments are not binding, but also provides appropriate uh, leeway for special rules. And in the discussion, it actually came out that there were quite a lot of specialized examples where for particular purposes, judgments were binding at the international level. European Court of Justice it has in its statute a rule which says that judgments are legally binding precedents. Uh, within European Union law, the European Free Trade Agreements Court has to treat the judgments of the Court of Justice as binding for certain purposes. Um, within uh, hierarchical structures, within criminal law and administrative review tribunals, there may be binding. So it's important not to say that that is a general rule, because it's plainly not, but also not to undermine the possibility to create it. And then draft conclusion eight 
adds some specialized aspects in addition to draw conclusion three, as probably judging Van de Coffey will appreciate, we benefited from the work of the Institute uh, and the NGA resolution on precedent in that regard. So that is, I think, a good example of mutual borrowing from different um, bodies here. I, I will probably not say a great deal about piracy and armed robbery at sea. I, well, I gather that that's probably not a focal point of uh, Chilean international law community at the moment, but just to say that this is something where uh, the language adopted last year largely traces, or at least the attempt was to trace as much as possible, the customary law expressed in UNCLOS and the practice of the International Maritime Organization. And what was adopted this year was also rather sort of a general uh, statement uh, building to some extent on palm cross. I have come to the very last point, uh, something that is of great, great interest of states, the non-illegally binding uh, international agreements, uh, which we will start discussing in the second half with a new special rapporteur, uh, Matthias Fortall, looking at identification of these arrangements and their potential legal effect, which may be direct or indirect. And I think, again, it, this is a sophisticated audience, but uh, you will appreciate why that is important. But this is extremely important for states, I think. From all of these topics, you know, lots and lots of things that are done in international relations and affairs are not done uh, through the treaties, uh, but through non-binding arrangements, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for less good reasons. But in either, either way, it's very important for there to be you know, greater clarity on drawing the line and legal implications of draw falling on this part of the line. And that, and that is all. Very good. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Sanction of international law commission in order to make a more sanction also relevant international law. Now we have time for questions and comments. Please raise your hands. You are invited. And if you don't, if you don't feel able to speak English, please do it that in Spanish, no problem. There is a question here. Yes, please. You may identify your time. Okay. Yes, sir. thank you. Um, I'm very grateful to have this chance to attend this activity. And um, my name is Magdalena Solis Ivaldo. I'm assistant consul for victims in the International Criminal Court. And um, my question is not exactly related with uh, the lecturer, but is very pertinent uh, in relation to the work that the International Law Commission done, and specific, specifically uh, related to the article of responsibility of wrongful acts of the state. I don't know if it's possible Where to- Do you want to raise yes, any questions? Okay, please. Um, but my English is not perfect, uh, then no, I know. Don't mind. Okay. Um, I think maybe the most important uh, work that the International Law Commission done is the ARCIWA. Uh, you work a lot in that, uh, almost 50 years, to looking for all the international customary law in relation to the state responsibility. And currently when we see the news about the, the West Bank and the Gaza conflict, um, I think about that um, in relation to prevent more damage. Um, for example, right now we look the, the news and also we follow the development of the judicial movement in the International Criminal Court for the individual responsibility and the international responsibility of the state in the International Court of Justice. And specifically in relation to starvation. And we know that in the place, they are food already. They are different containers with food and it's materially possible to prevent more damage. But for that, um, we need someone, maybe a commander, 
we do not courage to open the container and provide food with different people. And we know in the place there is not just um, 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 Hamas uh, belligerent and also the Israel, Israel commanders, but there is other type of militaries, for example, American militaries. And I think, do you think it's possible, for example, use the Article 25 of the RCWA, the necessity? Uh, you can, do you think that this is possible to have a justification to open that type of container and establish a, a precluding circumstances of an international ground act? Quite, quite too much, quite a talk. Yeah. Okay. In, this, in your field? In your field? Uh, I don't know if you can follow me because I know my English. Yeah, is it, it was very clear. I think it yeah. was probably just sort of, yeah. I guess, situating it. Um, so, I mean, I think it, in terms of analytical distinctions and what um, what the legal argument can help us with, uh, I think the distinction that that we are probably accustomed with from international law commissions work is between primary rules, which tell us what the obligations are. And secondary rules that are surrounding them as a default matter, as also circumstance precluding wrongfulness, as you say. Also, there would be a distinction between state responsibility and individual responsibility. Yeah. It's one of the concluding provisions in the ILC uh, 2001 articles and the corresponding uh, country provisions uh, in the um, um, ICC work. And it has been kind of confirmed that these are. <coughs> Autonomous. I'm not sure that the sort of that the question that the issue would arise in particularly those that that is the legal concern that in a sense is driving uh, practical considerations. So it doesn't seem to me that this is something that where a particular so so to get to the necessity point one would have to get to a point where a particular state is under obligation. I guess, sort of not to interfere in to provide uh, food. So it's sort of, I think, it, it, I'm not sure whether the factual scenario maps together with that. I would say that that something that ILC does provide is the overall tenor of thinking about such matters. And that is what comes from Article 41. Uh, something that in Article 41, ILC then described as progressive development of obligations of lawful cooperation uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, to preclude uh, the continuation of serious breaches of use law against rules and associated rules on non-provision of aid uh, and uh, non-recognition. And in the uh, draft conclusions on use law against, I also said that this is no longer a progressive development. So that I think at least provides sort of, I guess, the vector uh, for thinking through what conduct is desirable and what is undesirable. And that I think strikes more the legal political dynamic than the circumstance before the wrong point Thank you. I will invite Andres Delgado. Yes, please. Thank you, Professor Infante Martins. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have two questions that are not related between each other because your presentation was so wide ranging. So the first one has to do with the first part of your presentation about the ILC and the instruments. And you mentioned how the, the form that the, that the work of the ILC takes, takes place, like in conclusions, principles, guidance, and reports, sometimes changes depending on the aesthetic choice of the, of the, of the reporter. And I wanted to press you a little bit on this and thinking whether you think that it should, kind of, it should have other kinds of logic, whether, whether when, we, when the ILC decides to have a guidance, it should be for, because of the topic in itself, because of, of how right it is the topic in on itself to, to be discussed, uh, and, and to see a little bit about that, your thoughts about that. And the other one that I heard was about the settlement of disputes to which international organizations are parties and the definition of international organization. And when listening to you, I was wondering whether the idea of international legal personality was, was enough 
because if you are also going to be looking at domestic uh, uh, domestic uh, 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 domestic uh, uh, disputes and, and, uh, and this is international court sorry of international organizations being part of the, being uh, parties to to cases in domestic courts perhaps also the domestic part the domestic element of that legal personality should be part of the definition and those were the two that I have thanks a lot once again for the same time. Thank you, Andres. Great, uh, great questions, and a pleasure to see you again. Um, it is an ongoing discussion, I think. Uh, so I, I guess really it's sort of at the meta level of uh, whether these, whether nomenclature uh, should uh, be viewed as indicating juridical differences, or perhaps whether, you know, we can sort of say, well, there are articles are those that can, in principle, be a basis for convening a conference and adopting a treaty, which is sort of the point that the uh, statute of the ILC makes and other things. Um, and there are several schools of thought, uh, historically among the ILC members uh, and also among states. So there are some states that are very insistent on the importance of clarity of nomenclature, which I think is part of the broader insistence of clarity of distinction between qualification and progressive development. So that there is, I think, you know, sort of, I think probably in a practical sense, one might imagine that those are sophisticated actors that are sometimes a bit peeved that courts take ILC more seriously than those actors think ILC should be taken. <laughs> and that they would want ILC to be more explicit in flagging that something may be desirable, but if not law, and a particular type of output format that is viewed as indicating it would, would, would go that way. At the same time, I think that is also one of the things that perhaps, you know, discovering all the rich history of ILC, that there is more to it than articles and state responsibility. Actually, other forms, you know, Nuremberg principles were one of the first products uh, that uh, ILC adopted. So it's not the case that in the good old times it was articles and then ILC started to get fluffy. So the subtlety and Actually, you know, general endorsement of uh, the Nuremberg principles as a good form of expressing that point was there for the very beginning. So, you know, the uh, form of the three new uh, projects was uh, discussed last year, and they were two different forms. So, on guidelines, uh, guidelines for organizations, the sense was that this is that guidelines, in some sense capture that normativity and possible flexibility of precisely how it would be captured. So it would be kind of a mixture of various things of guiding what desirable practice would be. And there's a sense that, that a guideline captures that very, very, very neatly. Um, on the other two points, I have to say that my own preference as to output remained in the minority. So perhaps I, I, I have to approach it with a degree of caution. So on uh, piracy and armed robbery at sea, uh, I uh, felt that really for me, the primordial consideration was not in any way affect or even seem to affect UNCLOS and associated customer international law. And I feel that to the extent that we get into articles and the potential treaty making, it is extraordinarily hard to completely exclude that possibility. I mean, we know from, you know, from the old cases like, you know, case that, you know, very well mocks plants, the point that Crawford made that even seemingly similar textual expression might have different meaning because context is different and object purpose is different. So I was just approaching it with a great deal of caution and thought that something like conclusions might be a better thing. Uh, the drafting committee, I think, you know, under my own chairmanship, but in that position, I have to be uh, neutral on the on the merits. Uh, concluded provisionally that articles was a better form, but uh, in my statement, it was explained that it was open. But one can sort of see, and I think that there the argument 
of, of those who took a different view was to say, well, if we are proposing, for example, rules of extradition and criminal cooperation, these are not things that you can have other than on the basis of the treaty. And, and, and there's a, you know, some, I guess, almost policy points of the best fit and the direction of project. Um, subsidiary means um, where the special rapporteur proposed and most members accepted that it should be dealt with as conclusions because he viewed them as very close to the work on sources. So there was customary law and general principles. And so subsidiary means sort of logically concludes the first paragraph of 13. So that was conclusions, this should be conclusions. Uh, I was a bit contrary and I felt that precisely for that reason, they shouldn't be conclusions because subsidiary means are not sources. You know, the point that uh, ILC just made. So I thought precisely for that reason, a guideline uh, might be a nicer way of putting it. And if you look at, I think some of the things that are there that are plainly reflections of customary or some, like on the criteria of weight, I'm not entirely certain. And then there's some states, I think UK was a state who said it in the sixth committee that, you know, for conclusions, we expect that we are appointed to state practice and sort of such things. And while for the considerations of weight, they're perhaps presented in commentaries as of logical inferences of the character of the order or references to ILC's earlier work. <laughs> so it's a long way of saying that there's a subtlety in there. Um, and I have probably concluded that I am less certain uh, about it than when I started it. Okay. On the second question, I will say, and precisely, I think that, that is something that will be dealt with. So the second question was whether international legal personality is enough, whether we should look at domestic legal personality. And that is, of course, something that was key in many of the most quoted Tin Council, was ultimately a case that really turned not on international law, but almost on British corporate law to some extent. Uh, that will be something I think that will be very much on the special operators and commission's mind next year, uh, because of the distinction and the way how it has been drawn next year would have to be faced. And well, ultimately, if there's a sense that other things need to be adjusted, it's possible. Probably the only, I would have to actually to think through myself, I wouldn't want to commit, but probably the only one thing to say that these are definitions for the purposes of the project, in a sense that they are not driven that much by a, you know, kind of like a general sense of wanting to state the definition for all the purpose, but, of course, if it is needed for this particular purpose, that might come in, but that is perhaps something that permits a greater deal of subtlety and practical adjustments. Thank you very much. There is one first, Paula, and then my name. My name? Yes, very good. Identify us, please. Good afternoon, Professor Mabalinski. I'm Paula Cortez, Assistant uh, Professor of Public International Law at the University of Chile. And I would like to uh, ask two questions for you. The first question is about the um, immunity of the state's officials uh, topic. And my question is that thinking that now is in the second reading, and knowing that the commission, of course, is not isolated from what is going on in the world. I remember I had the chance to be visiting the commission in 2018, and when Professor uh, Escobar Hernandez was presenting the topic, I felt that from some states, they were very reluctant to work on this topic or to try to be very progressive about it. Because I think this topic is one that I think the desire <laughs> of, the, uh, of the aim of the topic is then that the state can make a convention about it, right? <laughs> not uh, a guidelines, it's not conclusions. So my first question is, with the uh, war now in Ukraine or with the reactivation of the conflict in Palestine, do you think this could permit the uh, second reading or the future of this topic? So that is the first question. And the second question is probably more personal. Um, do you think that 
or is there any uh, topic that you, that you think it might be uh, super important to analyze for the commission that you think, okay, this is a topic that the commission, like in the future program, I mean. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, on the second one, I think I'll just so say it. Uh, I I will defer my answer until the call this year. <laughs> um, on the first, I think I will probably be quite so. Essentially, the question of whether the great potential relevance of the topic of immunities in light of ongoing conflicts in different parts of the world, I guess makes it easier, makes it harder. Um, so I'll probably be quite, I suppose, sort of a bit cryptic in that regard. I, I think for, it, it, I, I mean, recall, questions that come to the International Law Commission should be hard. <laughs> the criteria for selection of topics are that these are things that where there's a states, there's a need for states uh, to address it, and that there is enough state practice. So easy and uncontroversial things, states are probably going to say, we don't think that it should be dealt with there. That is a valuable resource. Um, It certainly is, is interesting if we look at the comments by the states uh, and compare sort of the interventions on particular issues, that there were states that have intervened throughout uh, with positions essentially unchanged. There are states that have intervened throughout and their positions have shifted. There are states that have really intervened only uh, in reaction to the First reading and only in relation to one or two particular provisions. And I think it will be interesting to see, you know, sort of intervention in the future. Yes, one imagines that interventions that were had to be submitted by 1st December last year might have reflected assumptions that would be different if they had to be submitted by 1st of December this year. Uh, I will not say anything about how states might receive the mission's work afterwards. That is for the six committee and states in their wisdom to proceed. Uh, from a legal perspective, I think ultimately these are questions that international lawyers and law are well equipped to answer. We consider questions of the representativeness of practice, of consistency of practice, between states and also, in a sense, within states, whether domestic courts, the executive, le legislature, public pronouncements have been internally consistent, or whether they have been flip-flopping or coming in only at one point. And the ILC study on custom gives us a very clear answer that that reflects the way to be given. There is a premium for states to have good international lawyers, to ensure that, to be a bit casual, that ducks are always in the row, that state always speaks with one voice in all the settings. To the extent that a state can ensure that, its position will carry great weight. To the extent that states, that executive speaks in one direction, judiciary in the other, and flip flops every few years will affect its weight. So they are the bigger politics, but they do not affect our capacity to answer the legal questions. And in a general sense, I think. The fact that there is more practice and more interest, that must be good because, uh, you know, whatever one considers a desirable rule is, mm -hmm. the fact that these are important issues where we want as much and as broad state involvement as possible, uh, that strikes me kind of at the macro level, other things being equal, a good thing. Okay. Thank you very much. We have another question. Could be the last one. Are you tired? Yes, you must be. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay, but then there was the gentleman uh, yes. at the back, but you can approach him afterwards. Okay. My name, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. This was uh, extremely interesting. Um, my name is Sainte I'm, um, I'm an international human protection practitioner, mainly in the industrial state. It's 
And um, while I heard your uh, presentation on the question of the settlement of disputes between <laughs> international organizations and non-state actors, uh, that made me also reflect on the current impulse to hold corporations accountable for climate change related uh, harm. And while I, there is a lot of, of potential for international courts to hold states accountable for climate change related harm, uh, I want to have your views on, on whether there's any space for international courts to hold uh, corporations and, and non state actors accountable for, for climate change related uh, damage. Thank you. I, and I, as you will be familiar, as I sort of alluded to in my talk, lots of courts and tribunals are dealing with that. Uh, and without sucking up to Judge Infante Coffee, as she said in her declaration, that there is that delicacy that each institution operates within the limits of their jurisdictional mandate but also within the broader normative universe. So there is that delicate, that delicate sensitivity that tribunals cannot ignore it, but they also can do what they can, uh, in a sense, within the functional framework that they have been set up. And most international courts and tribunals are not set up uh, to consider such claims directly. Now, there may be implications. So before the International Tribunal for Law of the Sea, for example, there were states that um, argued that there was great relevance, for example, for investment protection treaties, and they felt that uh, actually the, I guess, teleology of investment protection treaties was essentially incompatible with the environmental rules and the climate change rules. You know, that is a position that the European Union has taken very recently in withdrawing from the Energy Charter Treaty. But that is not something that the tribunal went, is, went in, or I think any of the individual judges. So I think that that sort of speaks within that there may be the broader normative universe that I guess really seeps in, and then the normative universe that is further removed in the background. So I think that the answer must be that this is where domestic law uh, must uh, take the driver's seat. And I think the takeaway from sort of developments in counter claims cases, uh, uh, like Ferenco and Burlington and Ecuador, I think that they tell us that to the extent that domestic law provides far reaching rules on responsibility of corporate actors for environmental issues, investment arbitration tribunals will be very open to implementing it within the limits of that mandate. But in a sense that states have to do their work in that regard. Uh, and so I think that that is a fascinating development, I guess, really cases coming from all possible angles, sort of a bit of a you know, bottom-up anti-corporate cases, uh, you know, coming from Organta, but also sort of across the world, uh, including in Latin America, and possibly kind of legislative wishes in that direction. It's interesting, and I, and I think it will be very interesting to see when um, oral proceedings in ICJ case start and the written statements are released. I think that states are thinking kind of not in an abstract sense, but in a very practical sense, because a lot of money and policy calls turn on this. So it's a, it's a great question. I think that lots of very smart international lawyers are thinking precisely about that right now. Some of them may be pressured here. <laughs> Will be working on, on the on the subject, which is very not only important subject, but it's uh, very urgent, urgent because states can work in isolation and they don't have sometimes the tools to work in isolation. They have to work with the actors, state and non state actors that are playing already, yes, uh, on their territory. Well, thank you very much. We have to put end to this uh, very substantive and uh, a very encouraging session. You know, the International Commission is attracting the students to cooperate with the, with the members of the International Commission. I mean, members are allowed to have assistants who go there and to participate in studies. So that is also another uh, area 
for some talking <laughs> on, this, uh, on this lesson. Thank you very much. It has been a privilege for the Institute to have me here. And I hope that the pictures and photographs were active in order to disseminate this very nice uh, uh, conversation. And uh, if you would like to have coffee or juice with some of the participants, you are invited. Thank you.